Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. You know, for the next hour and a half or so, we're going to be here together. We're going to talk about Vermont's electricity policy. We might be getting a little bit into the weeds, but hopefully not too much. But most importantly, we're all here gathered together uh, because we care about the same issue and we want to know what to do about it. Um, looking around the room, I see familiar faces. I see new faces. This might be a completely new topic or issue to you. Uh, this might be something that you've studied and thought about for hours and hours. And so um, I'm hoping that today will be a space where we can all like learn together and ask our questions together. And um, I think most importantly, the energy and the intention of this room is not leaving when we walk out the door. Um, what's most important is what we do with this information after we leave. And that's where we're going to be making our impact. Um, and that's what we, what Vermont really needs is a strong climate movement um, to be making a much larger impact than we already are. So, so thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to have Marcy come up and do a, a sh short land acknowledgement. Um, Natalie Braun, who's here, is going to speak just shortly to the 350 Burlington node and why it's like the coolest group of people ever. And then um, we're going to get things rolling. So yeah. And then this is the microphone for anybody. Um, How's that? Looks okay. good. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see everybody. Um, fabulous. So here's my long land acknowledgment, um, if you'll indulge me. Um, I met with Judy Dow last week, an Abenaki wise woman, to talk about how to do a land acknowledgment. She told me that this practice began in 2015 as one response to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which addressed Canada's long and horrible history of indigenous residential schools. I understood Judy to say that a land acknowledgement is owning our relationship to the land we are living on. What is the nature of this land? 18,000 years ago, I think, we think, thereabouts. The land below and surrounding us here was weighted down under miles of glacial ice, 400 feet below sea level, which is 500 feet lower than it is today. Over time, the glacier retreated north and opened up a passageway to the Atlantic Ocean, causing salt water to rush in to form the Champlain Sea. As this land was freed from the immense weight of the glacier, it began to rise up and throw the salt water back into the ocean, making way for the fresh water of Lake Champlain. And here we sit today in the presence of that lake with gratitude and reverence for it. And we honor the Abenaki people who have cared for this land before us. In that spirit, Here's some wisdom from Robin Wall Kimmerer, a Native American botanist and teacher. In the Western tradition, she says, in the Western tradition, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings with, of course, the human being on top, the pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation, and the plants at the bottom. But in Native ways of knowing, human people are often referred to as, quote, the younger brothers of creation. We say that humans, we Native Americans say that humans have the least experience with how to live and thus the most to learn. We must look to our teachers among the other species for guidance. Their wisdom is apparent in the way that they live. They teach us by example. They've been on the earth far longer than we have been and have had time to figure things out. And here's uh, another quote. Being naturalized to place means to live as if this is the land that feeds you, as if these are the streams from which you drink that build your body and fill your spirit. To become naturalized is to know that your ancestors lie in this ground whether far or near. Here you will give your gifts and meet your responsibilities. 
To become naturalized is to live as if your children's future matters to take care of the land as if our lives and the lives of all of our relatives depend on it, because they do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy. That was beautiful. Got it. Natalie, do you want to come up and speak briefly to the, the 350 Burlington node? Thank you. And this is a little clip to put on for audio. OK. Does it need, may I just eat this microphone and will that be good? Uh, yeah, that's for somebody's individual. So, um, oh, oh, I see. Okay, Perfect. great. Could I just hold it? Sure. Yeah. All right, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just holding it. So this gives you, Gail, I'm going to walk up. I'm going to let you put this on my scarf just where it should be, if you would. Excellent, thank you. So my name's Natalie Braun, and I am the um, sometimes facilitator and frequent email sender from the 350 Burlington Node. And I am so delighted to see all of you today. If you wanna get an idea of what we're capable of in the 350 Burlington Node, look at that table back there of all that good looking food. <laughs> and I want a special thanks to Marcy and er for handling the majority and all of our other node members for stepping in today. So currently, you know, we go, we go primarily in terms of what 350 Vermont, because they have great wisdom in their campaigns. And right now we are supporting those campaigns around the renewable energy standard, obviously and then some very significant things around some ordinances in Burlington, as well as the McNeil plant. However, there is space for any, everyone's gifts in the Burlington node, even though that sounds kind of very legislative. And I just want you to know, we, we meet every twice monthly, uh, there's an online option. Uh, in person has been wonderful over the past six or eight months. And what I would do is invite you, Campbell, I'm gonna have you raise your hand. She has no idea I'm doing this, okay? And me, if you are interested, if you're not already on our Google group and listserv, just in terms of, even if you never show up or can't, I think we have some pretty good information coming out around what is happening. The meeting notes are very concise and just in terms of keeping your finger on the pulse of what 350 Burlington and to a larger degree, 350 Vermont are doing. So Campbell or me, after, whenever you have an opportunity, we will happily take your information, pop you onto that listserv, and um, you will be exceedingly well informed from there. So thanks very much. Awesome, thank you, Natalie. So I'll speak just a little bit to 350 Vermont. Uh, my name is Connor Wirtz. I'm a community organizer. Uh, I use he, him pro pronouns, and I've been um, organizing here in Burlington and a couple other parts in the state for a little bit over a year. Um, 350 Vermont is building a people-powered and people-led climate justice movement in Vermont for a just and thriving world. And what that means is that it's our mission um, here on staff and all of our leaders, our volunteer leaders, to empower you to take the action that you need um, in order to like really like try to address this climate crisis at the roots. So um, really like our ethos and our mission is not like to you just sit there and take directions. It's um, we need as many leaders in this in this climate movement as possible. And um, we need intersections um, and like to be addressing all of the oppressions out there um, in order to really dig into the roots of the climate crisis. So um, we have teams all across the state and we focus on both local and statewide action and policy. Um, do you wanna talk about the agenda really quick? Okay. So uh, for a little bit next, for the next like hour or so, um, we're going to go into introductions and just kind of get to know each other uh, briefly in small groups. Rebecca is going to give a, sh a short presentation, kind of info download on electricity in Vermont, where it comes from, why it matters, and what's going on right now that we can do to make it better. 
Um, there'll be a Q&A, so you can kind of answer or get any clarifying things out of the way that you're confused about. And then finally, we'll kind of lean in towards that, like, well, what's next? What are we going to do about it? So hopefully you'll leave today feeling empowered um, and uh, with a couple of things to do so that um, we can be making a difference as soon as possible. So um, without further ado, we're going to do a pair share for probably just like five minutes or less. So just a couple minutes and um, find somebody that you don't know and answer these questions, what brought you here to this workshop? Um, what do you think the connection is between electricity and climate change? And if you want something silly, um, talk about your favorite pasta shape, because I think that tells you about a person. Okay. Um, I'll yell at you when we're going to uh, just have about halfway through and find somebody you don't know and get to know them. organizing around electricity in our state. Um, so we're going to talk a ton about electricity. Um, I just want to say that when we talk about the problems with what we have and what we do want to see, this is representative of a lot of volunteers and folks just like you coming together and asking hard questions and doing tons of research and really thinking through this. Um, so I just want people to keep that in mind. Um, we're going to start with a quiz. Um, so I'm curious, what percentage of Vermont's total electricity use do you think comes from solar or wind? So if you think it's from 60%, raise your hand. Okay, no takers, 40%? No. How about less than 20? How about 5%? Cool. So less than 20%. Um, pretty right on. Um, how about how much of Vermont's electricity would you like to have come from solar and wind? And we can just shout it out, like as loud as you want. 100. <laughs> I think I heard like complete consensus for 100%, um, which is <laughs> yeah, with a little small, with small hydro in there. Um, awesome. So that is kind of what we want to see ultimately. Um, so we're going to delve into why electricity is so important for climate change. A lot of you probably already know, um, but also where it comes from and a little more details on what we want to see. Um, before we start, we're going to try something called the sticky note chat room. So um, we've got a bunch of sticky notes. I'm going to pass this around and people can just rip off like a couple. Um, I'm also going to pass around some pens in case anyone doesn't have a pen. Um, so while I'm doing this presentation, you'll, you will most likely have a lot of questions and most likely at some point be confused, um, which is totally fine. And if you have any questions, you can write them down um, on your sticky note. Um, we're going to have a chance to pass them up and Ben is our resident electricity expert and he's going to answer some of them. Um, but if we don't get to all of them, um, if you can put your name or, and contact info on there so we can make sure to get back to you um, next week. Um, that way we can make sure everyone's questions get answered. So before um, diving into all the details, I just want to frame the conversation a little bit. Um, so when we talk, um, so one important thing to remember as we talk about electricity and its issues um, is that there's no 100% electricity generation, generation solution, which means ultimately we also need to talk about how, as a, com as a community and as a culture, how are we also thinking about using less. So an example of this is like there's a lot of talk about electrifying vehicles, which is certainly way better than fossil fuel cars, but what about things like walking and biking and carpooling and uh, transportation that works for a rural state and all of those kind of things. So I just want people to hold that piece as well. Um, in that vein of there being no perfect solution, um, we're definitely going to need solar to meet our energy needs. Um, but it's important to think about 
how solar is done in a couple of different ways. Um, so one thing um, to just remember is that both solar and wind technology, at least currently, um, need certain minerals in order to work. And um, so you can see on this chart, one of the minerals those things really need is copper. And 89% of our copper reserves um, are either on or, 30, or within 35 miles of federal Indian reservations. Which means that, and the, as, you as you can imagine, the impacts of mining these minerals is really significant, really hard on communities, um, and often there's no kind of prior or informed consent. So that's an, just another piece of this to hold. Um, I do want to mention there's some federal work on the federal, hopefully federal level, hopefully coming down the line about how do we recycle those minerals so that we're not having to continually mine them. Question. Yeah. The last slide. Can you tell us operating and production? Oh yeah, sure. So operating means like the, it's happening. They're taking minerals out of the earth. Um, Pre-production scoping means the actual mining isn't happen, happening yet, but they're either looking into it or they're like starting to set up the mine process. Okay. Um, and I also just want to mention I will send out all of these slides to everyone. And um, there's lots of clickable links, so you'll be able to click the links as well. Yeah. Okay, any question that is asked without a microphone is not on the tape. So that's why I suggest that somebody hold it and then pass it. So if somebody says they want to ask a question, you pass it to them. If you're comfortable with not having any of the questions on the tape, that's fine. I'm just saying. If you Maybe perhaps the person was answering the question could repeat the question. Yeah, that's a great idea. We we we, we can we can do that. Um, and if for some reason you're not having you're not comfortable with your question being on the tape, I'm happy to either put it on your post-it or I'm also happy to talk after the presentation. Um, and so um, this is a bunch of further reading around mining and indigenous lands, and also thinking about like uh, um, thinking about. Post uh, like what it looks like to not have such an extractive world. Um, so a bunch of more resources around that people can look at afterwards. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the solar siting question, um, which even among people who really care about climate change can be hard. It's a really hard thing to talk about, and there's lots of different opinions and lots of different different perspectives. So I just want to name that that is something that comes up and um, something that like we all need to talk about and listen about. Um, and I think ultimately what it comes down to is thinking about where our power will come from and whose backyard it's going to be in. Um, so we can hold that as well as we talk about this. OK, now we're going to dive in. So um, a lot of our proposed climate solutions, so things like cold climate heat pumps, um, transportation, are going to dramatically increase our electricity use. And this is one of the sort of solutions that's put forth a lot for climate change. But electrifying, so shifting from fossil fuels to electricity, is only going to reduce our emissions if those electricity sources are actually um, low emission sources. Has anyone heard about the renewable energy standard? I hadn't heard about it until last year. so. Awesome, this is great. Um, so the Renewable Energy Standard, which is often abbreviated as the RES, um, is a law that was passed in 2015 that said, OK, electric utilities, you have to provide 75% of your energy from renewable sources by 2032. And 10% of that needs to come from in-state sources. So like. I don't know, what do people think? Does that sound good? Decent? Kind of? Not too bad? Yeah. I and mean, I was like, that's, go Vermont, go. maybe? <laughs> Could be more, but, um, but it's, it's, it's actually pretty deceiving. Um, and there's some real problems with the renewable energy standard. We're going to talk about all of these, um, but just as a quick overview. Um, so problem one is what is considered renewable. So in its definition of renewable energy standard, or sorry, renewable energy, um, the standard includes large-scale hydropower from things like Hydro-Quebec, um, 
And it also includes biomass. And these are pretty problematic sources of electricity. Um, number two is that it actually allows utilities to meet the renewable energy obligations. So to get towards that 75% goal by purchasing these things called renewable energy credits while still providing non-renewable energy, um, which sounds like impossible, we're but we're gonna talk about how that happens. The last thing is that um, the res actually makes it really hard for new solar and wind, both in our state and regionally, which without that, we don't really have a good way to get fossil fuels off our grid. Okay, so we're gonna go back first and talk about the problems with what the renewable energy standard considers renewable. So we're large. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, go for it. I think. I I missed the last point. Oh yeah. Um, so the last one. I'll just repeat it again, and don't, we'll 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 take a deeper dive into it. But just that. Just um, the number three. Number three. Yeah, I can go back to the screen too. Just that. Um, the renewable energy stand standard makes it hard for solar and wind to be built regionally, both regionally and here in Vermont. Um, okay. Yeah. So large hydro, um, electric, and biomass are considered renewable. So what is wrong with this? First, let's start with large hydro. Um, so the way um, like Hydro Quebec basically what is able to get so much generate so much power. Um, is during the 70s, they flooded a huge amount of land, 3.8 million acres um, of forest to, meet, to create dams in order to have enough um, power to generate electricity. Um, there's a number of problems with this. So first of all, this, uh, when all, those, all that organic matter is, flo is flooded and it's sitting underwater, it starts decomposing. And when it decomposes, it emits methane, which is a really potent greenhouse gas. We, when we say, oh, okay, large hydro, you're renewable, um, you're bringing us closer to our climate goals, there's nowhere where we count all those methane emissions. It also um, displaces indigenous communities and poisons food supplies and eco ecosystems with mercury. Um, again, very little conversation, very little consent around this. Um, we're also losing that 3.8 million acres of forest, which is a carbon sink um, for taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and on top of that, we're losing biodiversity um, and it's causing a pretty big amount of ecological destruction. So um, this is um, James Papatier. He's a member of the Kikasia Kik tribe. Um, a First Nations tribe up north, and um, this, is, this is what he says about the flooding. No one ever consulted or comp no one was ever consulted or compensated. The dams destroyed our way of life. Our original village was flooded. Our resources in our trapping territories are flooded. We've been dispossessed of our territory. For those who buy energy from Hydro-Quebec, they need to realize that it destroys cultures the environment. So this is one way where, when we think about hydro and we, if we think about new hydro, um, it would be a, a exporting basically the harms of our energy use to other communities. We're the only state in New England that says large hydro can be considered renewable for our renewable energy standard. Other states call it the renewable portfolio standard, but it's the same thing. The other thing I want to touch on is biomass, um, which I know is close to the heart of a lot of folks here in Burlington. Just, is anyone involved with uh, McNeil and trying to stop their expansion? Awesome. Cool. Um, so folks are probably pretty familiar um, with a lot of the problems with biomass. Um, I'm just going to say this one quote because I think it illustrates really well. Um, so for each kilowatt hour of heat produced using wood initially is likely to add two to three times as much carbon to the air as using fossil fuels. Um, in our 2021 annual power mix for, for, for Vermont, um, seven and a half percent of it came from biomass. So that's also something we really don't want to see considered um, as a renewable energy. 
Yeah. Sure. Um, so in 2020, our 2021 annual power mix in Vermont, seven and a half percent of our electricity came from biomass. I'd just like to add that uh, New York State and Massachusetts don't recognize biomass as renewable. Um, and I'm just going to repeat that. Um, so, 20% of uh, energy comes from McNeil? Not from McNeil, but 7.5% comes from, um, bi from biomass. And sorry, do you mind saying what you just said again? Um, that maybe into that microphone if you don't mind. New York State and Massachusetts don't recognize uh, biomass as a renewable energy source. Only Vermont does. <laughs> That one just goes, that's, that's just for the recording. It doesn't actually amplify, but it the means the video can hear it. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, so problem number two is these things called RECs, and specifically um, unbundled RECs. So what on earth is a REC? This stands for Renewable Energy Credit, um, and they're really confusing. Um, so it's basically a certificate that every megawatt hour of renewable energy that enters our grid receives. And these RECs, basically like these stickers, they can be bought and sold separate from the actual electrons that they're associated with. And when that happens, it's called unbundled. So this is a way that we can essentially greenwash our electricity. This is a screenshot of Green Mountain Power's um, web page where they explain what their annual energy mix is. So what, where does the electricity that they're selling to their customers come from? And just to be clear, this is, this is not intended to pick, pick on Green Mountain Power. This is what the state says, t is telling them to do. Um, and this is what the renewable energy standard is telling them to do and, this, and why it's problematic. So they say GMP supply is 100% carbon free and more than 78% renewable. So that 22% that's considered carbon free but not renewable is from nuclear. Um, the 78% renewable portion looks like this. So um, you can see, so this is specifically, again, Green Mountain Power. Um, so you can see that they have the 21.1% nuclear and then um, 28.6% is from uh, other new renewables. Um, only 21.1% actually came from solar and wind. Um, you can see that the majority of it came from large hydro and that that other renewable section is kind of broken out into um, wood, a little bit of methane, um, and not a whole lot of wind and solar. What's, what's the dark purple? The dark uh, existing Vermont hydro. So that would be like small hydro projects, which are fine. We just don't have a ton of capacity to expand those further. Um, so the rest of that, so remember on their, their webpage, they said we're 78% renewable. Um, and so, and there's like a little, like around 20% that's from solar and wind. Where does that extra 56.9% of renewable come from? These are all the sources. If you don't want to read all the percentages, that's fine. But all the little frowny faces are saying, like, this is not something that we should be thinking of as renewable, either because it's not actually low emissions or because it's not really a just form of electricity or both. Um, and I'm just going to mention here, I know I keep using the word renewable. Um, and folks have brought this up in the past. It's, it's a rather unfortunate semantics. Um, issue and that like our state is looking at is looking to increase our renewable energy but renewable doesn't always mean low emissions or just so just I'm going to use the same language as the state is using but just to keep in mind um, so seven percent of what this renew of what um, Green Mountain Power considers renewable is actually coming from natural gas and then as you can see a lot a huge chunk of it is large hydro um, and also you can see the wood in there um, from biomass um, and also a couple other not so awesome things. Um, sorry. Okay, so how is it possible that natural gas can be called renewable? Um, people have a lot of strong feelings about this slide. They either really, like it either makes so much sense to them or it makes no sense. So I'm just gonna ex explain it this way, take it or leave it. Um, we'll, we'll try a couple other ways to explain this. So the renewable energy credits, so the sticker that you can move around to say electricity is renewable or not, 
Um, it's like if you had an organic tomato that had a sticker on it, that has the USDA organic sticker on it, and you had a conventional tomato. And you could take the sticker off of the organic tomato and put it on the conventional tomato and then say, okay, this tomato is now organic because it has a sticker that says it's organic. This is basically what, how the unbundled, is, is a simplification of how the unbundled renewable energy credits work. So in this analogy, the organic tomato, maybe it's solar power, and the sticker is the rec. And so that solar power comes with a sticker that says renewable. Let's say the conventional tomato is um, maybe our ISO New England grid mix. So this is like a soup of electrons that's in this big grid in New England. And um, for example, in this Green Mountain Power um, in 2021, got 15% of their electricity from that. Half of that soup is from natural gas. So in this situation, Green Mountain Power can take that sticker from the solar, plop it on that natural gas, and say, we bought the right to say that this is, organ that this is renewable. Um, and that's how unbundled renewable energy credits work. I want to take a quick temperature uh, check, because recs just don't really make any sense. Um, so if folks can raise their hand, like, how confused are you? One, I'm totally confused. Two, confused. Three, halfway there. Four, almost there. I'm like, maybe a four. Um, five, got it. Okay, awesome, cool. So I'm gonna try just one other way of explaining it. Um, and again, feel free to take it or leave it. So, um, just another example of why the problem with unbundled recs. So if you buy, if, if you're Green Mountain Power and you buy 100 megawatt hours of power from a natural gas plant, you can claim to be using renewable power as long as you also buy 100 recs, those stickers, from a solar farm. From a solar farm or even like, or from Hydro Quebec. Um, well, the stickers I'm sort of using as a shorthand for these renewable energy credits, which is really, they're not actually stickers. They're like a, cert, they're like a piece of paper, a certificate. Um, and so um, when RECs are sold like this, so uh, separately from the power they generate, that is when we call them unbundled. The problem with this, um, in this example, that natural gas plant, it's not burning any less gas and it's not putting any less carbon emissions into the atmosphere. The energy the utility is selling isn't actually coming from renewable sources. It just looks like it is on paper because of that label, because of that sticker. The solar energy the farm is generating is already being used somewhere, and that natural gas is still being burned. Meanwhile, this is another way that we can export the harms of our energy use. Um, so this is a natural gas plant um, in Connecticut, um, and under our renewable energy standard, using the um, renewable energy credits, this can be called renewable. Um, oh, sorry, I think I just a slide in there. Um, I just want to mention earlier we talked about how um, in that pie chart, seven percent of the renewable was coming from natural gas. I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but as we do the electrification we need. So as we install cold climate heat pumps in our homes, as we electrify our transportation, where is our energy going to come from? Um, we can't. We don't want to. We don't want to draw more energy from nuclear. Um, small and large hydro is pretty at capacity. We certainly don't want to see large hydro expanded because that's likely going to mean more flooding. Um, which leads us to that system mix. Remember, like the electron soup from the ISO New England grid? Um, that's almost half natural gas. So we don't want to see that 7%. We don't want to see it there at all, but we certainly don't want to see it expand. Um, and that's, if we don't change things, that's where our electricity is going to come from. So um, the, on the right, again, that's a picture of that same um, natural gas plant in Connecticut I mentioned earlier. It's right next to a school. Um, its footprint's about 64 acres. Um, the map on the left there is, is downtown Burlington. That's what it would look like um, if that gas plant was here. That's how much space it would take up. Um, 
I didn't, so, so I, I, for whatever reason, I hadn't thought about it this way, but um, in New England, there's 81 gas and oil plants. Well, here in Vermont, we have zero. We do have McNeil, which is not great, and we do have Rygate. Um, but that means that when we're, not, when we're not seeing our electricity, when we're not seeing solar panels here, it means that we're putting the harms of our electricity use in someone else's backyard. Okay, so what are the problem with unbundled RECs again? They allow utilities to meet the renewable energy obligations, that, that law that says you have to have 75% of your electricity come from renewables by buying RECs while still providing that, in part, um, non-renewable energy and exporting our harms uh, of energy elsewhere. Okay, problem two. Um, particularly with these unbundled Hydro-Quebec wrecks. This is one of the ways that um, it's made harder for solar and wind to be built both here in Vermont and also in our New England region. But how does this happen? So this is what the current renewable energy standard looks like. Um, so you can see there's big hydro. Here we are in Vermont. Here is green, like whoever, Green Mountain Power, other electric utilities, buying wrecks from large hydro. Here's also maybe some solar in Vermont. Um, other states have obligations to meet for their renewable energy. But remember, they can't buy those renewable energy credits from the big hydro. They're not, it's not, they're not allowed to consider that renewable. Um, so they, so Vermont, who are uh, utilities in Vermont, these are only about $10 a piece, the ones from Large Hydro. So we buy those cheap ones. The solar ones are maybe about $35 a piece. Um, these other states can't buy those ones. So they have to buy these more expensive ones. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, in that previous picture, we saw um, solar being bought out of state and that going to other states for them to fulfill their renewable energy credits. They're still, not, they're still, I'm gonna go back to that other slide for a minute. They're still, those other states are still buying power from natural gas plants too and then doing the same thing, sticking the solar credit on it. But what would happen if Vermont said, okay, new, new plant, we're gonna change the law to say no more unbundled Hydro-Quebec wrecks. So Vermont utilities, you can no longer buy those stickers from Hydro-Quebec and stick them on other power. And what if we also said that our utilities needed um, their electricity to come from 30% new in-state wind and solar? Okay, so three things would happen. The first is that those utilities, so those utilities can no longer buy those inexpensive wrecks from Hydro-Quebec. Um, now they need to buy in-state solar and wind. As demand for electricity grows, we're gonna need to meet those new demands by building new solar and wind. So rather than buying natural gas from out of state and then buying a Hydro-Quebec sticker to say, okay, this is renewable, we can't do that anymore. Um, so this is if we were to say, no more unbundled Hydro-Quebec wrecks. Instead of the picture on the left, which is the initial slide we looked at, we would have what's on the right, where we have more solar and wind in state, and that's what our electric utilities are buying to supply us with electricity. So how would the rest of New England meet its renewable energy requirements now? So remember, they were buying some of that solar from Vermont. Now, Vermont utilities need to use that solar, so it's no longer available for New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut to buy. What are they gonna have to do? They're also gonna have to build more wind and solar. So by us changing our requirements, we're actually helping there to be more regional in-state, or regional solar and wind, which again, is what we need to kick fossil fuels off the <coughs> grid. Um, so just another way to think about it, every time we put up a new solar panel, we're pushing natural gas off the grid and reducing emissions. 
Okay, we're almost there. I know this is a lot of heady stuff. Um, last problem. Um, our current renewable energy standard only requires 10% of renewables to be in state. Again, we're the worst. Uh, we have the worst requirement for new renewables in the entire region. So a quick overview again of like all the problems with the res. Problem one, what is considered renewable energy? That large scale hydro and biomass are considered renewable. Problem two, those pesky unbundled recs say allow utilities to meet their renewable energy obligations while still providing non-renewable energy. Yeah. Oh. Go for it. What do other states that do with their recs? Are they allowed to unbundle the recs? Let's, we're going to do a QA and a in just a second, okay. so we'll get to that. That's yeah. a good question. Um, um, problem three, um, both, so both because of those unbundled recs and the cap of only 10% in state renewables by 2035, both of those make it really hard for us to build new solar and wind both in state and regionally. Um, the last problem which we, actually, we, which we talked about when we talked about Hydro-Quebec is that the renewal, there's nowhere where those out-of-state greenhouse gas emissions from the production of energy, like with large hydro and methane, um, there's nowhere where those emissions are taken to, into account. Okay. So that was a whole bunch about what we don't want to see. Um, what do we want to see? We want to see our legislature change the renewable energy standard. And when they change it, we want them to say no new hydropower and biomass to be used to meet our renewable energy goals. We want them to say no unbundled recs. We want them to incentivize and prioritize solar and wind, new solar and wind in state and regionally. Um, and we want them to stop exporting the negative impacts of our energy. So the, the graph on the left was that one from the beginning from Green Mountain Power. The one on the right is, is what we're proposing to the state. So that would be 30% new in-state renewables, 30% new out-of-state renewables, and then 40% pre-2010 renewables. Um, and this would likely still include Hydro-Quebec because we have a contract with them until 2038, but we certainly don't want to see them put new hydro um, into our grid. The policy stuff on this and the details can get super complicated and confusing, and it's really, it's okay to not understand all of them. The real takeaway is that we need to and we can do better on this. And in 2035, we, our electricity could come from 60% new solar and wind if we lay the foundation by changing our renewable energy standard to allow us to be able to do that. We're almost there. Um, I just wanna mention rates briefly um, because this is, this is an important question and 350 Vermont is a climate justice organization, which means that the justice piece and how this is going to affect people is really important. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that oil and natural gas, how much the rates, how much they cost, change a lot with based on what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, and right now, the way it's looking is that fossil fuel costs keep going up while renewable costs keep going down. And this is... Um, a bar, a bar graph showing um, the blue is natural gas and the orange is standard offer solar and you can see in this instance the standard offer solar solar stayed about the same um, whereas the natural gas was going up up and down in cost. Um, if rates were to go up that does not mean that we have to bear the burden of that. Um, one thing we'd really like to see happen is for a Ratepayer Protection Act to be passed. And there's actually a bill um, sitting in the House Environment and Energy Committee right now to that effect. And what a Ratepayer Protection Act would do is it would say, based on income, there is a maximum amount a ratepayer would have to pay on their electricity bill. The other thing um, is that these additional costs could be um, unburdened from us, from the ratepayers, and they could be covered by 
um, the general fund, which is something that the state does a lot for other, other programs, and there's no reason why that couldn't happen. So I'm just going to reiterate, that was a ton of info, and it's okay if you don't understand. Um, part of the problem with the renewable energy standard is that it's really complicated. Um, so if folks have questions, I'm going to ask them to pass them this way to Ben, um, and Ben, we're... Um, oh, yeah, Steve, you my back. Oh, yes, and Steve is here, too. So we've got two electricity experts, um, and I think we have, like, like, seven to ten minutes, and whatever we don't get through, we'll, um, we'll try, we'll follow up with other folks. Okay. Great. And if you want to put your email down on your sticky note, that way if we, if we don't get to the question, we'll email you a follow-up and make sure that you understand this. Okay? This one is amplification and that's recorded. You can sit over there if you want. Or you can just that off. Yeah. Um, do folks want to, Ben's just grabbing a drink of water, but do folks want to pass their questions up this way, or you can also pass them to Steve, to who's in the black vest. And if other questions come up after this, um, that's great too, and, and um, we have lots of sticky notes. Okay. That's a field one. This is the death one, I guess. Or something. I, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, we're, we're well mic'd up. Thank you. Yep. Sure. You want to? I might. I don't know. Well, there's only going to be three, two, or three. Two, two, okay. Sure. Okay. So I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Is everyone uh, is everyone ready to uh, have anyone your last last questions? I guess we'll. Um, how much time do I have then, Rebecca? Um, I think if we could keep it to like five-ish minutes, so we still have okay. time for people to talk. Okay. The best I can do is just the way they the order that came in, and then we can um, if we if, if somehow we knew your email address, if, you know. Or to be honest, we could just answer the questions that get sent out to everybody, right? That's probably the best bet. So, um, okay. Um, okay. 
reading glasses on. So the first question is, how do other New England states handle their RECs, renewable energy credits? Do they, are they bundled or unbundled? Um, well, um, that's a good question. I think the key thing is that um, the key thing about RECs, as you saw, is what the states consider renewable to get a REC. So other states seem to be better at, at giving thing, only things that are clean electricity a renewable energy credit. And, um, and the renewable energy credit device, you could call it, started like maybe 15 or more years ago, mostly in California and a few other states. And the goal was to add an extra and wind and some other renewable energy. And um, so, and the idea was that they would ra keep ramping up the requirements for the utilities to get more and more solar and wind. And, and then if they didn't get the, the right amount of RECs, they would have a penalty. And then they use that penalty to, act, to also, I believe, incentivize more renewable energy. And um, so that's how it worked. And they were allowed to use, um, they were allowed to use unbundled RECs, I believe, because before 2017, Vermont had nothing, no kind of idea of RECs. And some of those RECs came from projects in Vermont because for people who wanted to build solar projects could get an extra incentive by selling the RECs to states that had a REC program. So um, I know that makes it even more confusing, sorry. You could, you could, I, <laughs> yeah, go I, for I could add to that that you could also say that the big problem with our unbundled RECs is where they come from. So ours come from Hydro-Quebec. Um, at the same time, uh, let's say um, a utility is importing natural gas powered electricity from the regional grid. Uh, you can claim a REC from Hydro-Quebec to satisfy the requirement, but that doesn't put the greenhouse gas back in the stack somewhere else where it was burned. So that's that's the key thing is that that uh, you can't it, it doesn't we don't have a system for accounting for uh, out of state carbon emissions. We just pretend that these out of state wrecks, the Hydro Quebec wrecks in particular. Um, and another aspect of those, uh, those Hydro Quebec wrecks is how old they are. Um, a lot of the talk is about uh, the concept of additionality, which means new stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, if you think of the uh, UN and IPCC reports and, and the Paris Agreement and everything, that talked about needing to move the needle on climate change. They took a snapshot and said, right now, uh, here's business as usual, we're in deep trouble, we have to get down to 1.5 degrees maximum temperature increase. And, and they developed pathways for reduction of carbon emissions. Well, if you're just using something that was built 40 years ago and claim that, then that's not a reduction in carbon emissions. That's just moving the pieces around the deck chairs on the Titanic or something. You know, it's not new. So um, those, you know, uh, that's what, uh, when Rebecca described the 30% in-state, 30% regional new renewables, that's the idea there is to, is to move the needle. I don't know if that directly answered your question. Yeah. It's not just Hydro-Quebec wrecks that are a problem. Burlington Electric, for example, buys wrecks from other old hydro projects in New England, some of which are over 100 years old. That's correct. And as, as do uh, Green Mountain. Green Mountain Power gets its, whoops, gets its, uh, hydro, large hydro wrecks from about a dozen different places, mostly hydro, mostly hydro Quebec. Ben and Steve, maybe just one more question. Yeah, well, these, uh, there's two that I think I can get through pretty quickly. So um, this one is, this was a small part of the presentation. Water sources with mercury. I think that's the nature in, in northern Find 
it in there. Hatchery releases mercury and it gets into the rivers and then the fish that um, the indigenous folks Last question, why is small hydro better than large? Um, the the small, large hydro tends to be what they call store and release. They have a big dam, they store the water behind the dam, and when they need the power, they release it and generate electricity. Small hydro tends to be what's called run of the river, like the one on the bridge over to Winooski. Um, it, if, if there's lots of you know, rain and, and a huge amounts of water, um, the water flows over the dam and doesn't generate electricity. It generates electricity depending on how much water there is. It's not storing the water to generate electricity whenever it wants. The storing and the releasing is what causes a lot of the methane emissions. So the, there, there's also a low impact hydro institute that certifies hydro projects as being low impact. So that's another way of looking at good versus bad hydro. <coughs> Another way to look at the large hydro is that uh, uh, Hydro-Quebec has flooded an area total among, you know, dozen pro dozens of projects, an area the size of the state of Vermont plus another like 15 percent. And their plan for the future includes five more new large uh, areas of uh, flooding. Uh, so it's ecosystem destruction. It's destroying an ecosystem that has been the home of indigenous communities forever. And, and so those people are now forced off of their traditional lands into, you know, uh, modern uh, villages that are built by, uh, by the power company for them to live in. And it's, it's uh, you know, changed their entire culture. So, and, and uh, I uh, know some of the tribes have been uh, accommodated with funds and, and so on, but some have not. Some never have. Um, so it's a real mix on that score, but um, it's certainly vast ecosystem destruction. Thank you both. Um, here, I'm going to announce our next already answered. Great. Well, thank you everybody for getting through um, a lot of that large part of the content piece. And it sounds like it can be a little like sad, um, but we're we're going to dig in very soon about what you can do about it. Um, so, but for now, for the next five minutes, um, would love you would love to do another quick pair share. So, um, find a different person than the person you met the first time. And um, just spend five minutes and just say, like, what, what are your feelings right now, your questions after hearing all of this information? Are you surprised? Are you angry? Are you like, yeah, I kind of expected that. Um, would love, yeah, so just share your feelings. And um, if you want to get some food, this is a great time to, like, grab some snacks, stand up, recharge while you're chatting. And we're going to come back together to talk about what to do about this in five minutes. Okay? Break. we can actually do about this. Um, and I'm actually just, in case folks are, um, in case anyone ends up leaving early, I'm gonna pass around this sign up sheet. If folks can make sure they sign in, that would be so appreciated. Um, Connor is gonna hand that out. And um, So we have a real opportunity this fall to change the renewable energy standard. Um, and that's part of why we're going around and doing these events. Um, and the reason we have this opportunity is because so many folks like yourselves have kind of made us think about it and said this is not okay what we have and we need to, we need to make it better um, so that, because right now we can't, we leg electricity companies legally cannot do what we need them to do in order to change things. Um, so that's why we need to change what the renewable energy standard looks like. Um, so, just a little background. Um, last legislative session, there was basically sort of a, a, a better renewable energy standard introduced, and that said 
um, that pie chart we showed earlier that said we want 30% new in-state, 30% new regional, and 40% from old sources. Um, and that went to this committee called the, and called the House Environment and Energy Committee. Um, and what happened was that they decided to create a legislative working group. So this is a group that meets outside of the session. They're actually meeting right now. Um, there's both legislators on the, in the group. There's um, people from electric utilities, representing electric utilities in the group. And there's also um, environmental organizations in the group. 350 Vermont is not part of that group, but we, um, our ally, some of our allies are in that group um, asking for what we talked about um, today. Um, and that working group is gonna come out with recommendations in early December of what a reform renewable energy standard could look like. And so it's really important that um, we're making it clear now, even before the legislative session starts in January, what we wanna see. Um, so how do we do that? Um, one way is contacting your representative. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt, it never hurts to build a relationship with your representative and talk with them about what you care about. Um, so I would encourage anyone to do that, whoever your representative, representative is. Um, for this bill, the representatives right now that have the most power are those people who are on that committee, the House Energy and Environment Committee, where this bill is gonna be talked about and debated and basically it's gonna have to get through there before it can go on to becoming a law. Um, so this is a list, list of folks um, who are sit on that committee, um, particularly for Burlington folks. I'm curious if anyone is from the South End or knows people in the South End. Awesome, cool. Um, so that is a really, um, that it, for, for folks who live in this area, that's a really important um, district because your rep um, sits on that committee. Um, so um, another, uh, so particularly where we would love to talk with people from the South End. If you have family or friends or community in the South End um, and are open to talking to them about, um, talking to them about this or introducing us to them and connecting, that would be awesome. We also actually have another event very similar to this um, in two weeks happening here, same place, slightly different time. Um, and it's gonna be geared towards families. So it will be a little bit longer. There'll be free childcare, also food. Um, and so especially, anyone's welcome to come, but especially if you know people with family in the South End, yeah. Just, just in terms of like family friendly, um, what ages? Any age, where, yeah, so you know, it's like, there might be babies crying in the middle, that's fine. A toddler might come in and need their parent, that's fine, yeah. Um, we really want to be open to everyone. Um, what else can you do? Um, so in addition to connecting us with those key districts, which when you get this slide deck, you'll, you'll be able to look through those, um, making a public comment to the legislative working group, um, it's a lot less scary than it sounds. So they meet um, every other week um, and making a public comment means uh, it's done virtually. You let their assistant know you wanna make a comment. She sends you a link and then it's like two or three sentences of what you wanna see. Um, and the group can't, there's no back and forth. So you're not gonna be like grilled on what you said. You just say it and then it's, that's it, it's done. Um, and it's great for them to hear that people are watching and what the public wants to see. Um, there's also spreading the word about this in your community. So this could be writing a letter to the editor or putting a post on Front Porch Forum. Um, and then in January, we're also gonna have um, a big rally at the State House. So that is another way folks can get involved. Um, what we're gonna do now is just take a few minutes to do, fill out um, some next steps forms. Um, so this is a way for you to say what you might wanna do and also what support you might need from us. Um, there's a few different documents on that back table um, about doing some of these next steps, but um, we, all, all, we also have a lot of materials we can send you um, for, for specific, if there's specific things you're interested in doing. Um, I'll also use this time just to mention, there's a, we, I also printed off um, an article about Hydro-Quebec on the back table that might answer a lot of the Hydro-Quebec questions if people are interested. Um, so I'll give folks um, maybe five minutes to fill out those next steps forms and then we'll come back together and we will close.
you're too that right. Already full up. It's up from Middlebury, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. I'm glad you're coughing. One more. Thank you for your And here's a note. Um, this is from the third act. Thanks for that, Steve. And I'll send in our follow-up email. I'll send a um, like a how to make a public comment, and I'll put those dates, the dates yeah. on there. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. But this Wednesday, is, and they're online. You can watch them on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they're they're up. They're recorded, so you can watch them at double speed. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> are the meetings open to the public? Mm -hmm. They are in the state house, and you can. And you can make a comment in person there without going to Zoom. Uh, but uh, if you're going to watch it online as an outsider, you can only do it uh, through YouTube, which means you can't participate. You have to let them know if you want to make a comment. And then you get on your Zoom. Maybe another minute and then we'll come back together. Thanks everyone for taking some time to think about next steps and um, you can either come put them up here at the end or pass them this way. Um, we're going to do a quick closing. We're going to, um, but before we do that, I just have, um, I, we just want to make sure we can read everyone's email addresses who asked for questions. Um, so at the end, if um, I think it's you Hill Murph, but we just want to clarify that this is the right email address. So if you don't yeah, mind, you know that's right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah. <laughs> So to close, we're going to do a one word go around. Um, <coughs> maybe folks have done this before. Um, and it can be a thought, a feeling, um, a reflection, but one word. Um, and we'll just go around in a circle. Um, I can start. Um, uplifted. And I'll pass across the room. Outrage. <laughs> Hopeful and outrage. <laughs> <laughs> Can do it one word. Mm. Informed. Uh, motivated. Mm. Um, hopeful. Community. Mm. Oh, um, 
Determined. Did did everyone in the back row get a chance? I don't know if everyone in the back row got a chance. You did? Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, I was writing everyone's words down because it makes a nice poem. Do people want to hear what we all said together? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uplifted, outraged, hopeful, hopeful and outraged, informed, motivated, hopeful, community, overwhelmed, upset, knowledgeable, connected, excited, energized, optimistic, sorry, something I can't read, <laughs> disappointed, dumbfounded, enraged, overwhelmed, heartened, collaboration, determined. determined. Thank you. Thanks so much everyone for coming. I also wanted to just say a huge thank you to the 350 Vermont Burlington Node. They really, all of the outreach, the awesome food, which people should totally eat more of afterwards. Um, thank you so much um, for putting all, all of the work into helping make this happen. Um, and all of you for coming out on your Sunday to hang out and learn about electricity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.